So first, the first thing that we're going to do, um, learning and inverse problems come up a lot, and across the board, whether you're doing uh, just spatial work or inverse problems, so just going to start by sort of formulating learning problems in an abstract way, which is always dangerous, but I think we can do it in a really nice way. So we're going to formulate learning problems. in a general way. Just look at that a little bit. And then once we formulate learning problems in a general way, it doesn't really mean anything. So we're just going to look at really simple ones that you guys are familiar with from that perspective. So the second thing we're going to do, look at simple examples. And the simple examples are going to be just linear regression classification. So this is regression classification. From in, in this from this perspective, so see what what the general thing really means in these cases that you see before. Okay, and this will connect to some of the things you're thinking about, hopefully. And then the third thing is, well, what's the point of all this stuff? Of looking at things generally, looking at examples. What, what can we really do with it? So we're going to throw in a challenge. This is a challenge that we all face, and that's noisy data and outliers. So we're going to think about a specific challenge that comes up no matter what problem you're working on. It's a kind of challenge. It's going to be outliers in the data. Uh, and so then we're going to show that actually we can take this whole general formulation that covers all the problems we're ever likely to encounter, we can actually make it robust to outliers in a hopefully understandable way. So that's our main goal, is to see how that plays out. So hopefully you'll get some feel for all this stuff can be helpful. So this isn't something that we can implement on a complex problem like uh, convolutional neural networks, but it is something that we can implement in a way that you can play with and look at in the classification case. So first we're gonna say, so I'm gonna do, show you robust extension. The robust extension is gonna fix Fix this challenge for us again. And the final things, this are these two things dovetail with the numerical presentation Pung is going to show you. So the last two things that we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, uh, instances of classification. So the classification is the simplest possible case that we can find that sort of relates to what she Strong was talking about. She was talking about being able to sort of do image segmentation and identify buildings from geospatial information. So there's a lot of complex modeling goes on there. So we're just going to focus on classifying zeros and ones and classify building-like objects from non-building-like objects. But you can kind of see everything under the hood there, and then you can see how this outlier stuff plays out. So we're going to look at classification, and we're going to actually play with an implementation that Pung made. So we're going to play with the hands-on example. So you can see what, what happens. And then, the regression classification are too simple to be directly useful for the stuff that you're doing, but the concepts actually generalize nicely. So, because everything, the, the, the extension will be raw, it won't be specific to these, these two problems. So hopefully that will be fun, and then you can kind of, you kind of see how things play out in that kind of way. So that's kind of the plan. So, and then let us know, like, afterwards. Okay, so afterwards we're going to have lunch, so you can talk to us, and then we'll stick around questions about methods and things like that, and then give us feedback about how we can make this tutorial more useful for future hack weeks and so on. So it's, it's kind of the first time um, we're doing this exactly. Okay, so that's the plan. Let's start with writing down kind of a general general thing. Um, <coughs> just kidding, I can actually hide behind the board. <laughs> <laughs> So going to formulate just the, every single possible problem that you could ever ever encounter this way. So what does learning really mean? So learning, learning and inverse problems, uh, that really relates to um, you're going to be doing some kind of fitting or some kind of training. So this is just kind of going to go straight from the words to the specific 
optimization problems. So we're going to have some kind of fitting, some kind of fitting, some kind of training, using some examples. Okay, and so fitting and training using examples, that takes us right down to minimizing some kind of misfit or just looking at some criteria. So we're looking at a look at a fitting, fitting criteria, or fitting some kind of criteria, right? That's how we really know that we've learned something. So we're able to get close between what we expect to see and what we actually do see. So this kind of whole thing just actually ends up with a very, very specific typically minimization thing, minimization problem. So it's, it's the minimization problem, which is why we're even here. So we, in applied math, we're working on iterative algorithms to optimize the problems. So the fact that a lot of learning and inverse can be stated in terms of minimizing criterion is what kind of even brings us to this field. So minimization problem, we we'll write it abstractly, but as simple as possible. So we minimize with sample parameters x, some kind of sum, i going from one to n of fi of x. This is it. This is kind of going to be the most general thing we're going to consider. Where x are the what we're after. So these are some kind of parameters that will help us. Okay, and obviously all the action has to happen in these fi. So i1 to n are some kind of examples, a set of n examples that we have. We'll kind of see inputs and outputs, and the fi is going to link the examples together and give us the criteria for how well they fit. So the FIs are going to link, link inputs to outputs. Everything is hidden in the FIs. Link inputs to outputs. Okay, and provide a criteria to see how well the Xs are explaining things. How well we are doing. So I'm going to start it, right? Is that all good so far? So I'm going to give you guys like the most simple possible problem, which is a two-dimensional regression problem. We're just going to look at two-dimensional regression just from the point and from that point of view and link everything together. So I'm actually going to switch this work here because I feel like I'm fighting, fighting myself all the time because I have to hold the board as I write and read stuff. I think it's working out fine. That's so, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Yes. I didn't realize you could do that. Okay. Okay, cool. So let's start with a 2D regression problem. So I'm just going to draw some stuff. So I'm going to call the independent variable A, and then I'm going to call the dependent variable Y. Just to, so the notation is consistent, and so we want to fit some kind of regression line here. Okay. So in this case, the parameters that we're looking for when fitting a line is the slope of the intercept. So that's pretty straightforward. So the x that we're looking for are the um, intercept, x not intercept, and x not slope. Okay, and then we have the some kind of mechanism that connects y's to x's. So this is the inputs to outputs link. Inputs, inputs A to outputs Y. Looks like this. So YI for the ith example is just equal to X0 plus X1 AI. AI is your ith example. So these points are labeled maybe A1, Y1 through AN. Y n, A's of scalars, Y of scalars, everything is clear. That's your deterministic prediction mechanism. So we're almost there. That's the link. And the final thing that the F has to do is it has to give you some kind of criterion of fit. So if you're predicting, then your Y should be close to this model that you're getting with your X0 and X1. So the FI here should be some kind of criteria. So for in many, many ways we can explain this, but even without explaining it's pretty clear, we can just write down some measure of distance between the y's and the predicted stuff, could be y i minus x0 minus x1 a i squared, the squared distance, many other criteria that we can use. So put all this stuff together. So now our learning problem in this case is going to be minimized over x. Um, Sum i goes from 1 to n, 1 half 
y i minus x zero minus x one a i squared summed across all the different points. We want the distances between the predicted things by the line and the actual data to be overall as small as possible. All the information is sort of hidden in these f i's of x's, which both give you the link between the predicted and observed data and the criteria on the data in linear regression. Let's pause there. Any, any questions or thoughts? Or okay, so the next thing we're going to do is going to do a second example. So this example, I feel like, is going to be really nice for everyone. The second example is also simple, but slightly, there's a slight twist to it. It's a classification example, and we want that because the classification is the um, the final thing we're going to be looking at. So the classification um, is just going to be it's going to be slightly different, a little bit more fun. So we're going to draw the same picture. So we're going to have an independent A here. But now instead of actually drawing the points, I'm going to draw pluses and minuses in this space. We call this kind of stuff before. Plus, plus, minus, 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 plus, minus, plus, minus, plus. Just don't make it too easy. Minus, minus, plus. And so in a studio space, classification, we want to try to separate the pluses from the minuses as well as possible. So maybe it would be something like something like this. Uh, I know there's some pluses, minuses on one side, pluses on the other side, but that's pretty good. So we want to separate those out. Um, so then in this case, things are changing a little bit. So now the labels, the um, dependent variable yi's, it's either going to be plus one or it's going to be minus one. So largely we care about the sign. Things we would care about are we on the one side or are we on the other side of this plane that I drew. The plane though itself is still linear in this example. So the plane still has sort of, I can still write down the equation for the plane as x0 plus x1a for a generic a. Okay. So we want to, what do we want to do? Well we want we want first a mechanism by which this thing is going to try to predict the label. Y i, right? So we want to predict label, which is either one or minus one, from from plugging in x zero plus x one a. So then the most you know the obvious thing is looking at this picture. So if it's small, we want to say it's minus one, and then if it's big, it's the plus one. Okay, so that's kind of how we're going to predict. And then the criteria that we care about, we don't care about the magnitude so much anymore. What we mostly care about is that the signs agree, that the sign of the predicted thing is matching the sign of the label. And so what we want to do is we want to make the signs the same. So in this case, in contrast to the regression, so our goal is make the signs the same. So the signs of the yi and x0 plus x1 ai. And so when you want to make the signs the same, one really natural thing you want to do is you can look at the product of the two things. So if you just look at yi times x0 plus x1 a, uh, and then you can think about the signs. So if this is positive and this is positive, the sign of the product is positive. If this is negative, this is negative. It's positive, the bad this is good. <laughs> and, then, and then if it's plus minus, product is minus, and if it's minus plus, product is minus, and then this is bad. For some reason I circle the good here and the minus is there, but <laughs> overall it's pretty good. Okay? So it's a good and bad, so we want to make the signs match up. And so how do we make the signs match up? Um, well, that's what it begins. So to make the signs, we want to uh, look, for, look at a function that's going to penalize negative stuff, but not penalize positive stuff so much. Okay, that's kind of what we're going to do. So it's really easy to draw a function which penalizes negative stuff. This is kind of our like our misfit criteria in this case. So here's a function that penalizes negative stuff. 
So here's the bad part. And then here's the good part, right? This function is going to be applied to the product. So if the signs are mismatched and the magnitude is large, it's going to penalize you a lot. But if the signs are the same, it's going to penalize you less. So that's just the criteria we're going to apply. There's lots of ways to derive it. There's other criteria. So really, another alternative that's really, really common is this one. Kind of doing the same thing. If you use this function, you get logistic regression. If you use this function, you get a support vector machine. The concept is really, really similar. So you're going to, I can write down a functional expression for that function. Here we go. So it's going to be log of one plus exponent of negative input. That function sort of looks like that. And now I'm just going to apply that function to the product because I'm just trying to help it make the signs the same. Okay, so I'm going to write my fi in this case of x is going to be log of 1 plus x of minus yi x0 plus x1 ai. So that's my fi. And then, so in each case, the thing is trying to, for every example in the training set, this function is linking the inputs to the outputs and it's trying to push the signs of them to be exactly the same. So the learning model is now minimize over x, the sum i equals one to n is f i of x. So let's pause here in case you just got kind of more questions about that. So you just evaluate, so this is gonna be a number. So you evaluate x zero, so you're gonna, you're given an AI, like, your independent variable, you're given that, and you plug it in, and you multiply it by your x1, and then you add your x0 to it. So that number is either gonna be big or small. So maybe it can be positive or negative. So I made it big and small, a little bit big on purpose, because you may not always necessarily pick positive or negative, but the most, the easiest thing that you could do in nice situations, you can actually, if this is negative, just say it's minus one, and if it's positive, just say it's plus one. But then depending on how you pick that threshold, it's just gonna change whether you care so much about catching the negatives or catching the positives, if you know what I mean. So it's sort of the threshold is up to you. That's a really good question. Any, any other question? Okay, so just to link up with uh, Hung's notation, this is a very particular case when we have just two dimensions so that I was able to write an intercept and um, an intercept in a single independent variable is a slope. More generally, we can have lots of variables. We can have, so A can be a vector. AI can be a feature vector. So if you're doing classification for whether somebody has cancer or not, AI can contain information about them, their height, weight, diet, things like that. If you're doing image classification, A can be an actual vectorized, pixelated image. So it can be a very long vector. So in Pung's example, A is going to be exactly a vectorized pixelated image. And so this piece, more generally, is written as an inner product. So we can write the predicted, predicted uh, predictor for logistic regression as uh, either x transpose A or this notation, x comma A. And what both of these really mean is just the sum of x, i, a. <sighs> That's so like keep the i, x transpose ai, or inner product x with ai, and then the sum is now going to be over the entry, so you need a new index j. So if you don't care about this, ignore it, but if you care about it, j equals 1 to m, where m is the length, xj aij. Okay, so it's just the inner product of x to the vector a is going to give you that number that if it's big, you think it's one class, and if it's small, it's the other class. So the more, most generally, we just take this notation and plug it in here, like this, and then we understand roughly what it means, and then it captures all these other types of classes, okay? So that's one thing I wanted to say. And the other thing I wanted to say before we go on to the robust part, I think we're doing okay on time. The other thing I wanted to say is, when you get go from this case, the just the progression, something like neural nets, you still think about it, Where's the x? You can still think about it like this. 
shifts, there's even more happening with that F. So it's going to tell you just a little bit, because everybody's interested in neural nets, it's just going to draw out a little bit what happens for you when you go from logistic regression to a neural network. So neural network, we're used to seeing some kind of representation like this. Inputs, inputs are going to be A, I, so it's going to be A, I, 1, A, I, 2, A, I, 3, and then connected through some horrible or nicely drawn, depending on the book, set of edges to some smaller set of nodes called like C1, C2, C3, or something. And this connects yet to another C, and finally, Next to, in this case, maybe plus one or minus one because we're looking at classification. Okay, so you kind of so you used to see this representation. So the right way to think about, ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, the right way to think about how to go from here to here is just imagine the fi is becoming a little bit more complicated. Okay, it's the fi. Remember, does two things. Number one, it provides the link between the inputs and the outputs. And number two, it provides a criteria that kind of tells you um, how well things are doing. So imagine that these edges are a linear, well, this is kind of like, the first it's like layer, layer one, this thing is layer two, and then um, let me just not focus too much on that layer. So your weights that you're training now become more complicated, and in addition to the weights, you have some kind of nonlinearity function imposed here. So you're gonna take your input, multiply it by x1, push it through a nonlinearity, multiply it by x2, push it through some output criteria, and compare. So your fi of x is going to look like some kind of outer loss, like a soft max. I'm not gonna go into detail here, because you guys, you know, outer loss, so, up, so which depends on the label. Um, and also depends on x2 applied to the nonlinearity of x1 applied to ai. Some horrible mess like this. This is still fi of x, and you still see the same thing. There's your label, there's your feature, there's your criteria, and this whole thing is your generating mechanism. So you can just you can abstract that away and not worry about it, or you can get really into it and think about all the different structures, CNNs, standard neural nets, through all throughout the network zoo will be reflected in how this thing is constructed. But we're just going to stick with this because it's uh, we can actually show you things. Does that make sense? Okay. So in the last part, we're going to talk about outliers and robustness. Are there any questions before we go into outliers and robustness? Yes. Uh, so if I wanted to go back and do this like really slowly and methodically over months and months, and you can hand me one book or one reference, is there a good self-learning process? Um, it's a really good question. Let me actually think about that and maybe get back to um, Anthony sure. and then circulate something out. I, I don't have like a single Magic. thing coming out, but maybe I can trace it through a couple of things. Okay. 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 So now. The beauty of the abstraction, right? Because we don't have to think about that um, or even that. What we can actually do is go back just to the abstract formulation and think about how to make it robust to outliers and what robustness to outliers even means. So let's just say we're solving any learning problem. We're doing this minimize it over x, sum i equals 1 to n by 5x. There's two approaches that have been historically, historically used. Um, and some of them are starting to look to me better than others. I used to be kind of doing one thing, but now recently I've been doing this other thing. But I'll tell you what. So the two approaches are number one, if you're worried about outliers. What does that mean? It means some of the examples, from i equals one to n, in some sense are bad. They're not helping you out. They're noise. Something is wrong with others. So you're worried about this kind of contamination. And you want your fitting process, the learning part about the x, to not necessarily depend on crazy things in your in those examples. So there's two ways you can go. One is you can change the FIs. Change the FI in some way. 
So how many people have heard of like Huber, Huber loss versus these squares? So, 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 so one thing you can do is you can change your criteria. Remember I had a least squares criteria? You can change that criteria, makes a lot of sense for aggression. Doesn't make a lot of sense for logistic aggression because how do you change this criteria? It's not, it's not completely clear. So for this and other reasons, the other thing that's becoming more and more seems like a good idea to me across a whole lot of different projects, especially ones that Pang and I are now doing, um, is you extend the model, just have a separate, a whole separate concept of inliers and outliers. So let's kind of extend the model. This one. So we're going to extend this model. So what, what are we really saying? We're saying every point can be an outlier or, or an inline. This is almost like a separate classification that we're doing. And you can actually think of extends in multiple ways, but let's just stick with this inline or outlier. So we're going to create a variable whose only job it is to track whether the particular example in all its detail or lack of detail is good or bad. So we introduce for each, each example, we introduce WI. Okay, and the WI is gonna track if the thing is an inlayer or an outlier. The way it's gonna do that, you're gonna say if WI is near zero, it's gonna be an outlier. You'll see why in a second. And then if it's near one, it's an inlier. So W is going to be between zero and one. And it's going to be, it's going to be zero, having small W is going to mean you're an outlier. Having basically zero, you're an outlier, one, you're an inlier. The way we're going to throw this in here is we're going to augment this optimization problem. W there's something missing here so let's discuss mm -hmm. that so say I just do this I just okay I so kind of explain it too vaguely but include W zero is an outlier one you're an inlier mi minimizing now over both X and W we're minimizing over X means we're learning some model parameters but W specifically just trying to minimize this Weighted combination. So what's wrong? What's missing here? Why is this not necessarily? Why don't you? Does anybody have any concern? It's going to say something. Something. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's something. But but, but but even more specifically, like what what might happen if you so W so you're trying to make this thing as small as possible. Let's just imagine that all the FIs are bigger than equal to zero, just to make it easier to think about. And you're trying to make this as small as possible. Okay. Let W equal zero. All the W's want to go to zero. All the W's, you can just think all the W's go to zero. Everybody's an outlier. Did yeah. I learn anything? No. <laughs> okay, so then you just want to impose something. You have to impose some additional information. You have to tell the model what's, insist that you at least have some inliers. It's up to you how much. It actually turns out to be okay. Because you can insist that 90% of your data are inliers. Seems to work great for a whole number of examples. Because even, even if you exclude some good data, the point is the bad data are much more damaging to you than the good data. So you just insist. So we also say that the sum of the WI is equal to H. And what's H? H is our number of inliers. You have to tell the model this. Everybody's always hoping that you don't have to tell the model this. Like the model will tell you also what proportion of your data are inliers and outliers. There's only so much you can ask it to do. Okay. Turns out if you have your own data, you are going to have an idea that you're not gonna have more than 20% outliers, or 30% or whatever, right? So it's just, okay, so now the thing is complete. So what is this trying to do? The WIs are trying to kill the Fs that are the hardest to fit, because they're the largest, set those to zero. And the Xs are trying to fit the remaining Fs as well as possible. So as you optimize jointly over the W and the Xs, you learn the model, and then the W helps you to classify between the bad and the good one. Okay, and so we did that just based on this representation, no specific detail for any application, then just it, hopefully that makes sense, right? So that's the whole idea. So just some, some history of this, in general, this kind of method is called trimming, but trimming is loaded work because there's lots of trimming. There's trimming that doesn't make sense and trimming that does make sense. So the most clear, Pointer in the literature is a method called least trim squares. 
this Wiestrom squares and by Rousseau, whose name I will misspell. So if I misspell it, I'm really sorry, Rousseau, he's still around. Uh, so Lestrom squares is doing it for these squares and some other things, but it works like really well in general for all the things that we've tried. So it's something fun to do. But so if you wanted to do it for something specific, you would need to go in and mess around with whatever the code that's currently training your neural net. So you'd have to open it up a little bit and play with it or work with somebody to do this. So you don't necessarily, can't necessarily do it for the stuff you're doing in this workshop because you're so high on the level of detail, right? But it's nice to just see what the whole point of this is. Okay. And then we'll show you some fun examples you can play with. Uh, yeah, any questions about this? Yes? So like in ecological research, it's sometimes, you know, if you don't want to necessarily get rid of outliers, is there some worry about that? Yes, so a fancy way of it's a great it's a good question. The question is in ecological research, you worry about actually getting rid of data because are they really outliers or you're just ignoring something. So there's always a worry. But so the most kind of relevant aspect that we work on is we work on global health problems. We're doing meta-analysis. So there too, you also don't necessarily want to throw away data, but you also don't want your findings to be really subject to weird studies. So for example, one thing that you're trying to do in global health is you're always trying to gauge how much the studies disagree with each other between study heterogeneity. Okay, so if you have a really bad study, that will control your entire concept of between study heterogeneity because it disagrees with everybody. So maybe you don't want your understanding of that to be influenced. So it's a little bit specific, right? So if you're worried about getting, if you really believe the data, you don't have to do this. Or if you believe that almost all the data is good, you can set the age to be very, very high, as high as it's acceptable in your field. If you want to believe all the data, you don't even have to go there. So. It's, 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 it's always a concern. Like you always have to think about like what is this doing for you? Why are you doing this for your case? Are you actually going to get something out of it, or is it just going to get rid of exactly that set of data that you want to improve? So, yes. any any other any other questions? Um, so there's a whole me method of like how do you do this? So say you so when you when you solve these problems, you're going to apply some kind of iterative algorithm, right? Because the only time you have a closed form solution for the x's is in the linear regression case. Even for logistic regression, you never have a closed form solution. You have to apply some kind of iterative algorithm. So in terms of methods and things like that, you would have to take whatever algorithm you use to solve that problem and then expand it to also be including solving for this problem. So that's exactly what Pung did. But I, I, I don't think this is, so we're not going into the details of that very much. But if you guys have questions about that or interest, that's the kind of stuff you could talk to us about at lunch or after lunch. Okay. Um, so I think I'm actually under time, uh, which is which is amazing. So ask a couple more questions, and then we can go so that you have more time to play with the examples of fun. Thank you. Anything else? Yes. So when you minimize your function up there, is there a point where you say you're trying to overfit something? You like to minimize it too much, or how do you decide? You know, this is a point of. That's a really good question. So actually, let me jump in here a little bit. So if you're just minimizing over data that you have, there's always the risk you're overfitting too much. And so something that you can do, I'm over simplifying the picture. So you can sometimes add to your optimization problem. You can add something that biases the solution in a way that tries to fit you from overfit, keep you from overfitting the data. So the simplest thing people do, the simplest thing people add is the little least squares penalty because the little least squares penalty pulls you to zero, which means you're biasing. But on the other hand, it'll keep you from going right to that particular data set. So you can add some kind of term like this. Okay, so you add a penalty. It's called the ridge regression penalty in statistics. You can think of it as a Gaussian prior on your variables x. You can think about all sorts of ways. It's, it's, it's trying to offset this kind of thing. And there's many, many other ways you can try to combat the problem that you're sometimes overfitting. So I didn't go into that to keep it simple, but actually you'll see in Pung's example, this thing is there in the formulation. So when he'll set up the logistic regression problem, he'll throw in a little regularization to keep things, keep things nice. It's a good question. You had a question. So I'm just thinking like how to Uh, wh why did I choose a specific yeah. functional form for this curve? Yeah. 
So this is it. So, so there's many there's th different choices. So this one you can drive um, from the Bernoulli model. So you can actually go through step by step and you can say, okay, I'm going to flip a coin. So first I'm going to assume that every coin has its own probability of being in plus or minus. And then I can take that model through to what the, what the likelihood model looks like for coin flipping. And you can arrive at precisely this thing. So this is one way to drive the specific functional form. But you can also have other functional forms like this one that goes straight down and cuts across. So that looks like the max of something. It looks like it has a thresholding function. And you can drive that by looking at some other concepts like the minimal margin. So by looking at different criteria, you can drive different functions. But isn't it funny that they all are doing this where they're trying to penalize sign mismatch here and then not penalize sign mismatch there. And they have some, so the, this function, after a certain amount, it just doesn't care what the size of the thing is. It just adds a zero to it. But both of these models, they consider zero to be closely related to the bad case. Because if you're zero, you're not sure he should be penalized a little bit. He should get to be as sure as possible. So they have really similar interpretations, but just different functional forms. And I'm not married to either of these functional forms. So, okay. so let's switch over to the more fun stuff. Um, and then Punk can project across all the different screens. Then you can also download and play with some of the stuff. So let's go through the second part of this tutorial, basically a hands-on exp experiments of uh, like what Sasha ta like the mathematical magic. So we just go through and see if actually actually works. Uh, in order to do that, you guys need to clone the repository of this tutorial. So if you can go to this website and then just maybe just copy paste this git clone uh, uh, command to your Jupyter lab, and then you will have full access to the repository of the workshop material. Right. So if you guys do that, there will be a workshop material inside of your Jupyter lab. And then inside the notebooks, there is one thing called like the logistic regression with trimming, which is the, what Sasha just talked about right now, about logistic regression and also the trimming. And then if you guys can open that notebook, just go through this material with me, that would be great. All right, so let's do this. So let me see if you can also this a little larger. All right, so like uh, uh, in this in this notebook, like we basically have a, a two two examples. The first one is basically the model of all the classification problem, which is the uh, uh, the uh, 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 like uh, handwritten digits. So like people actually, uh, if you click on the uh, link here, you can go to this amnest. Uh, data set. So this the, 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 this is their effort collecting all the handwritten digits and then try to do classification of this. So the like the full problem actually is you will have zero to nine, ten digits, and then you try to classify the ten digit ten digits. So if you write a zero, so it should tell you oh that might be a zero, that kind of thing. But right now we consider more easier kind of stuff. We think about like this is the only binary classification problem which means that our digits only consist of zero and ones. And then we are only want to classify, if there is a digit of zero and one, we can tell which, which, which digit is that. Is that clear? All right, so, and then the second one is more like related to uh, a, a geo uh, 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 applications. So I think Shay talk about like using the satellite image, right? I take an image, uh, the, the, the satellite image and then like have a bunch of fragment of the image and want to see if there is a building inside the image or not, right? This is the main application uh, I've heard. So we'll take a simpler version of that to see logis if logistic regression actually can accomplish that uh, mission, which means that we're generating a bunch of like uh, 
we think about what the, uh, the building looks like, and then we want to let this logical regression give us a classifier to tell us if it is a building or not. That's the simple goal we try to accomplish using this. All right, so uh, uh, basically in the, in the beginning of this notebook, there is like some math. <laughs> if this is too intimidating, you can just skip this. But I just want to point it out, this is a minimization problem, which usually we we'll think about this as our cost function. We never want to spend too much money, right? We want to spend as little as money as possible, so we want to minimize this cost function. So that's a thing. And then this is the logistic regression, the function form with Sasha like talked about before. And then each one of those, uh, uh, like uh, inside each one of the sum will consist of like data point of Y and A. So A is the image, and also Y actually is a label. So for example, if I have an image of zero, and then put in this image, and then we add my label also is zero. Oh, and my label will be minus one actually in this case. And then you, you put it in, and then that will give you a number of how much cost actually is this. So afterwards, we'll get X, which we call classifier. We're using this X to classify a new image. So we'll do some operation of this X with a new image together, give us some like criterion. Based on that criterion, we will just say if this is a zero or one. If that makes sense. Right. And also there is some weight, which is the trimming weight. Tell us if it is outlier or not. If this is zero, we said that corresponding image is an outlier. If this is one, we said that that's a good good image, that's a good data point, if that makes sense. All right, so, and then, like uh, as Sasha mentioned at the very end, there is also a small regularizers. So if you guys are familiar with like machine learning, there's always something called like overfitting someone, right, right? So if you want to avoid overfitting, you have to have this like regularizers. In statistical uh, uh, settings, this is called priors. It's more like a functional, like, uh, thing you want to enforce some like structure into your like solutions. For example, you can also put, put a one norm there if you guys ever familiar with one norm. Lasso problem? Lasso regression? No? Right, but it's okay. Like this is basically enforce you some more like structures of your like classifiers. Yeah, something like that. And also, like, could you guys tell me, also this make the optimization problem a little bit nicer. Could you guys tell me what is the minimizer of the exponential function? E to the x, what's the minimizer of that? Is there, minimizer means that the argument actually make the function as small as possible, like the smallest. Is there a minimizer of the exponential function? E to the x. Right, Sasha, let's draw this thing, right? So, <laughs> yeah, on the board, sorry if the internet cannot see that. But uh, this e to the x is when x goes to minus infinity, right? It will actually go to zero. So there's never gonna be a minimizer because as small as possible until it goes to infinity, the thing. So adding this quadratic like uh, uh, regularizer also like make sure that there will be a solution instead of infinity actually appears. So, uh, things will be a little bit more well-defined, make, uh, make, make this actually easier, have an easier time to converge also. Okay, so like enough of these math things. Let's go through some of the, the examples. So let's run this. And then the first one is the MNIST uh, problem. So we can actually see uh, if we run through this, there are 1,000 images of like zeros and ones. There are 462, image of zeros and then also 538 uh, 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 image of ones. So we want to see what the image of zero looks like. That's, that's a zero, uh, obviously. And then there is also a one look like that. So hopefully that part makes sense. All right, so Right now, yes, we want to creating this thing called like binary logic regression, which is a class of uh, including the solver is in the solver module. So all the all the uh, all the code actually is original. You can you guys can go to the source folder uh, of this uh, 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 like uh, uh, GitHub repository to to look through what the source code looks like if you guys are interested. And also you can like using some new if you have some new pictures, new images, you can use also use this to see if the logic regression can give you some sensible result afterwards, great. But yeah, let's uh, fade this. 
woo, it take uh, about like 10 iterations to, to fade the data. And then this is like actually something not we care about because we are optimization uh, people. <laughs> We're people. And then we actually <laughs> fitting this. Uh, this is called objective function, which is a cost function, which means how much money you spend actually to doing things. We want to minimize this. We want to minimize the expense as much as possible so we can see that this actually decreasing, which is really satisfying feeling of like re seeing your expenses are decreasing. And then there are like stop criteria, which is called this arrow. So at the end, we want this arrow actually to less than a tolerance. Right now, as I said before, to be 10 to the minus 6. When it's actually less than that, we just exit. We say that uh, our algorithm actually converge. So for this thing, actually re re return two uh, result. The first one is the classifier. The second one is the outlier. So the classifier is used for when you have new images, you're going to use this classifier to say if, if that image is a zero or one. So that's the thing. And then the outlier is basically say, what's the thing? What's the weird images actually you think actually is the outlier? You just output that. So like some people also have concern, right? You don't want to throw away the data, right? So this one actually you can using this outlier to do a secondary analysis. If you have the resources, you don't necessarily want to throw away this, these outliers. Maybe there are certain part in, in this outliers you can actually capture in afterwards. So yeah, all right, let's, uh, let's just see. So before we actually have some uh, training data and also some testing data. So testing the data also have some testing images. So the way we do using the outlier uh, a classifier is actually call this um, classify images and putting the images in the testing data, if that makes sense. And then it will return a lot of like prediction labels to tell you what is zero or one. So uh, there are many testing images, so and also like the this modified class labels can let you to output like different weird stuff. For example, to say the first class is blah, the second class can be blob. I don't know what I'm doing, but uh, it will uh, <laughs> output uh, these kind of stuff. But let's return to zero and one because it makes more sense. Uh, right, right. So it actually will return. Say that the first of several uh, pictures actually is zero. The second, sub, uh, like the second part of the picture is all ones, and then we actually have the labels uh, already. So the, this thing is uh, this command is basically using the predict labels. Uh, see if the predict labels equal to the like original labels. If they are equal to each other, we say that actually a success. And then we want to see what's the rate of success. Right now it's 100 percent because this is a really easy task. It's zero and ones, right? It's not. It's not. Right, I can do that. Yes, and then right now it's like some something interesting. So this is also a function called like plot classifiers. So we can actually plot these classifiers. So remember, Sasha mentioned in in the uh, during the uh, theoretical derivation, there is a inner product, right? Basically, it's, you do some very weird option uh, like operations of your classifier and image, and it gives you a score. And the base that score, you want to see if that is a zero or one, right? So the weird uh, operation we call inner product of two things. So in this specific image case is, for example, you have a zero and a one, right? Those, those images, zero and a one. And then it's a pixelized thing. So which means that in each pixel, there is a number corresponding to how much intensity it is, right? So for example, this purple one is all zero, and also the, uh, the yellow one is actually intense, like for example, like two, or what's the color, the maximum color, two to five, right? There's a number of two to five to that. So basically, I overlap this image with uh, my classifier, and then they have the same exact same size, they have the exactly same number of pixels. So in the same position of the pixels, I just time each other and then sum all the pixels after I time each other. So I overlap those two images, and then I'll show, I sum all the results together, if that makes sense. So you guys can see that actually, this zero is very dark, right? The dark region is most likely what is the zero gonna appear, look like that, right? So well, 
there is a zero like that, when I overlap them together, that will give me a negative number because in the region that actually zero most likely appear, it's really dark, it's negative. So when I do the oper weird operation together, that will most likely return a negative number, right? So that's how I tell it's actually a zero. So this is the, the this region actually is most likely what's the one gonna appear, right? So when they there is a handwritten one there, I overlap, that will give me a positive number instead. And then I, that's why I can tell actually it's a one afterwards, if that part makes sense. Right. So this is a more like intuition of what's going on in the logistic regression. Why actually we will choose that function form and then what's the classifiers, how the classifier classified the images afterwards. Right, please feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions. All right, let's go. So, so afterwards we can just uh, plot in some like the outliers, right? We, we're curious what is outlier looks like, why it's actually weird uh, to be classified as outlier. So there are 100 images, which is controlled by myself because Oh, sorry, I didn't like uh, tell you all the parameters here. So, <laughs> so in the model, there are two uh, default parameters uh, or like the option parameter. The first one is a lambda. It's directly corresponding to the, the like uh, this, this term, like how large of the regularizer you want to add in this. So the larger of this number is the, the X will be towards zero afterwards, right? The, the, the thing. Right now we can just make it default at 0 0.1. You don't, get, don't have to worry about that. The second parameter is optional parameter is called inline percentage, which tell you how much of the inline, how much of percentage of the, uh, uh, of the images you think is inline. Right now I say that 90% of the, was well, 0.9, 90% of the images I, I believe is inline. So I just plug in this 0 0.9 there and then yes. Yes, the question is, do, do I just not use the input from the data? So it's, is that, is that like, do I have like a way to do the lambda? You have to interact with lambda. Yeah. Yeah. So the functionality of the lambda and also the percentage is about that. Um, right, so those, those are the two parts. That's why we have like 100 outlier, or uh, what, how many outlier do we have? Like yeah, 100 because like it's 10% of, of like 1,000, right? It's actually exactly 100. And then there are 50 of those is zero, 50 of those is one. So if we see, for example, this one, yeah, it's obviously it's bad handwriting. It's hard to uh, classify, so that's why it's a weird, uh, like, uh, uh, right, it's a weird uh, uh, images. That's why it's outlier. Does this part make sense? All right, great. So, um, any questions? All right, let's go through the building de detection afterwards. This is like exactly the same concept, but it's just using a new set of uh, images where like we're actually simulating those images to make this like more uh, uh, attached to the uh, geo hack week, this topic. So it will be fun. So we have three kind of like uh, type of images right now. We, we call it building and then crosses and also outliers. So uh, there is a simulate uh, a Python module also. You have a function called simulate images. And then the first argument is the size of the images. Right now it's like, I say this, the images has to be 28 by 28. 
because it's logic regression and it's also my laptop, it cannot run too large of image, also, also it will break. And then the second argument, like, uh, want, like the second argument is the number of buildings you want to have, the number of process you want to have, and the number of outliers you want to have. There are three numbers there. So, for example, if I want to show you guys what the building looks like, I was just directly simulating one buildings there, and then zero process and then zero outliers, and then etc. So if I do this and I'm plotting the buildings, this is a building. So if you think about like this is a satellite image, right? You just uh, see all the things from above. A square is most likely to be a building, right? Something like that. Okay, and then we can also have some processes. So I don't know <laughs> why I choose this, but it clearly not a building, right? Maybe there is more than a design, but let's just say there's that's not a building, right? Just some weird road or something like the cross section of a road. All right. So and then also there are outliers. So this is really confusing because it consists of a <laughs> of a rectangular and also a cross. So it can re be really bad for logistic regression because it can it have the both of the parts, and then it it can like really confuse of like logistic regression. Don't know what's going on. Do you have you have like both both a building and also a cross, right? It can it can be really bad. So we call it outlier. So hopefully the, the trimming can automatically pick out all those things automatically and then think about maybe you can do a secondary classification of this outliers because you can see that both of them is like a window right maybe something else can come out from the outliers right all right so let's do this so we generate the training data so we have in this training data we have 100 of the buildings 100 of the crosses and 20 of the outliers Right, so 20 divided by 200 is 10 percent so we can still stick with 90 percent of the data actually is in layer so we construct this model which is still stick with the lambda equal to 0.1 doesn't matter and also this in layer percentage is 0 0.9 90 percent and then we're fitting the data and then convert pretty fast and then afterward uh, so my i pass in my labels of the uh, to the classifier to be building or not building and then i generating this uh, testing data on the fly so if i generating uh, for example if i generating a building right which is 100 denote a building the classifier should tell me actually it's a building in that sense right so if i run that yes it's a building it's the heap Right. <laughs> yeah, that's an outlier. You don't know Yes, we will go through that later. Yeah. So, so like, let's just run a couple of more times. This is also building. This is also building. This is also building, right? Great. Yes. See if we can like recognize if it is like an outlier, like if it is a cross, right? Which is not a building right now. So it's not a building, it's not a building, and it's not a building. I can do this all day, every day. <laughs> but it's not a beauty, right? So actually it's doing, doing a good job, it's nice. So right now, like, let's try to confuse this logic regression, which I actually uh, originally like leave the parameters of this in. I just give them the outlier to see if it can recognize if it is a building or not, right? So it's just that it, this is a building, this is a building. Sometimes it is not a building. So it's a really confusing for the logistic regression, right? To, to actually to see whether this is actually a building or not. So I didn't do that, but let's uh, let me do this. Uh, uh, classifiers of plot classifier. Or let, um, let me also plot this class classifier. So like based on our zero and one intuition, right? The, if, if the zero is most likely appear like that, I just put a bunch of negative number in my, uh, like in my classifiers around most likely where zero is gonna appear. And then when zero appear, when I do the weird operation overlap the images, that will give me a negative number, right? So in this one, it's a similar, like exactly the same intuition. Because the, uh, the, the building is most likely be a rectangular around this, this places. So I just put some like uh, negative numbers or like in, in, that, in the corners right now because of 
the cross also can appear in that place, right? But in the corners, the cross gonna not appear that. So I put some negative numbers there. When I overlap, the buildings will just give me a negative number, and then that's corresponding to beauty. And then I put a po like positive numbers, especially in the between here, because buildings is always hollow, like in my example. So there is never gonna be building there, but the cross definitely gonna touch this middle area, right? So in this middle area, if I have a cross there, I overlap the images, that will likely to give me a positive number. That's why I know actually it's a, not a building, it's a cross, right? So that's where the individual comes from, right? So okay, let's see if we, what's our outliers, right? Let's applaud our outliers. So there are 22 of the outliers, not exactly 20 because it's, there is like a, a floating number, blah, blah, blah. Uh, <laughs> but the most likely this outlier actually is the, uh, the, the this weird thing, right? From space number zero. Oops, because there are 22. And then this is the first two. And then the rest of those were just the, the uh, weird stuff. So we pick up all the like weird windows out as outlier so that you can do a secondary kind of like which is pretty fun. All right, so if you guys have any, like more images kind of data, you can actually directly put into this module. This is actually pretty general. You can uh, generating a class. Let me see, I can show you guys. Sorry, this is more like into the, into the weed of the uh, uh, stuff. So there are a bunch of like, uh, I can open these, right? This is Util's uh, 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 Python module. So there is a uh, image data. So if you guys have a bunch of images, you can just uh, like say, make a NumPy array, 2D NumPy array. So each row of those is a vectorized image. And then how many row of those there is, there will be how many images there will be. And also there's labels. You can pass in also labels there and then creating this image data class. And then you pass this image data class into the model and the fade model that will give you outliers and also classifier. And then you can just basically, you can have your own data set. Maybe you're interested in, try this out. If C velocity regression actually gave you a interesting result. Great, any actually, any questions? For Right, because usually for a realist, a realistic, you don't know what's the percentage of the outlier, right? In general, you just have a bunch of uh, pictures, uh, uh, data, and then actually you don't know. So right now, like as Sasha mentioned, we're working in this uh, like a global health kind of the context, and then actually all they do is they are just assuming 90% of the outlier for all of the applications because they actually have no idea. A uh, liar, sorry. That's really impressive, 90% uh, of outlier. But uh, <laughs> they only assume like 90% of inlier all the time and they just throw in the data see what happens. But in general, it catch, uh, you can do a cross validation somehow like using how many number, this is the hyperparameter, right? Like how many number of uh, percentages of the data you think is inlier, you can just uh, try maybe 90%, 95%, maybe 80% to see what the result looks like. Um, there is, will be a validation, it's like validation goes out. Right. Yes? So does the real study work in coming up with that classifier that you put in the general generalized image? Mm -hmm. Yes, so the whole thing, the whole computational resources is spending on this thing called like the model, the uh, thin model. But for you to do it, you all have done the bottom of the notebook. Yes. So that, that thing right there, you have to guide that? Yes, that's the result you want to like uh, guide you through actually to get a good classify afterwards. But it pops out out of the optimization. Uh, it's called the optimization for X. Right. And in this particular case, you can actually visualize the X that you get 
the Quran is saying, if you can interpret it, you can think of overimposing it over your kids to grant doing something, but it pops out automatically from solving the mathematical problem that your kids have on the page. So you don't have to hand draw it because you obviously can do that in like a general, more general time. Yes, yes, sorry, I didn't manage that because so you don't have to do any extra things to get this classifier. It's directly out of the, uh, out of the, the uh, optimization. So all we do is we want to reduce our cost, right? Actually, and then you will, because of that, the result will speed out something like that. It's actually kind of uh, interesting. So maybe just to show what happens to the classifier, right? The classifier looks kind of nice right now, but imagine if you don't know the models or out outliers. And you generate right. outliers, and then that's going to mess up the classifier. So it's going to get confused by the data it's trying to fit. Right. So, that might be like so if we have like 100% of the outliers right now, which is this is what it's 1.0. Right? You tell the model. You tell the model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. exactly that. So this is the model, and then they tell it actually instead of 0 0.9 here, I just tell it actually all the data is inliers. There is no outliers. They treat the uh, outliers also as inliers. And then basically I do this, and then I fit the model. And then let's see what the classifier looks like. It doesn't look that different because there's not much outliers. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Let's see, 100 outliers is the same thing as the inliers of the both of the class. And then I do that, uh, fitting the models. And then do that. It will be a, like a little bit random afterwards. Let's do 500. <laughs> it's really fun. Boom. So 400 means that you have twice as many outliers as good inliers. Mm -hmm. So it's like 600 total data points and two thirds. Of, so if you, what if you tell the model that 30 percent of the data are inliers only, and the model's total cover the classifier? If you actually tell it that you only have 30 percent inliers and 70 percent outliers, something like that. Yeah. Ooh, it has a hard time to converge right now. Yeah. With uh, 37 iterations, because there are too many bad data. I don't know, man. Oh wow. What is that? I don't think it's detecting the. See, the the outlier number is four hundred twenty, four twenty, and then there. Are, uh, right, you basically think that the uh, the other thing is outlier. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay. Let's go to let's let's go less crazy. Add uh, just below fifty percent, and then tell it fifty percent are outliers. The other thing. Fifty percent is one hundred. So it's 100, 100, so let's add 100, 100, and then 180. I cannot do the math, man. And then 0.5. Yes. Yes. So the, uh, the, 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 the classifier, the 0 and the 1. Yeah. So, so, so the way I generate an outlier is I create this windows, right? And I randomly assign if it is uh, like a building or a cross, right? So, so I think the way is the majority of the data actually is the, a window afterwards, and if I adding too much, and then they will just based on this window, he think that he really think the window actually is the road or the window actually is the, uh, is the cross. So, so, so that's why he actually, this one is basically brighten on the outside, also brighten in the inside, right? So that's exactly a window. So that one, he says that the window has to be positive because their majority of the uh, window image is the cross. No, window is the- Building plus cross. Building plus cross, right, right. Sorry, call it window, it's outliers. <laughs> So I think the majority of the uh, of the uh, of the windows is actually labeled as cross, 
So you actually think the, 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 the cross should be look like a window. So that's why the image is here. It's basically pretty bright, right? Yes. Yes. Right, sorry. Yes. Right, every number is based on the, yeah, that's a really good question. This is really optimization related. So every number, uh, how to say that? So yeah, like for, for example, we want to minimize in one of the scalar functions in the down. And then actually, when the zero is equal to zero, which is called critical points, if you guys do, sorry, it's like crazy, but if you uh, think about like there's flat bottom and you go up, right? So when the zero is actually equal to zero, then that will be optimal, which means that it's the minimum, right? So this is the same thing. Actually, we're treating the, we call like the gradient, which is in central is zero, okay, when this thing is really close to zero, it's corresponding to this arrow. I will think about that, but it's done, it's finished. And you are saying that actually is this tolerance can uh, achieve the similar kind of effect of the uh, regularizer. So I think there, in the early stage of machine learning, there is a thing called early soft, right? It's basically if you now like model solving the problem like QPN, and then it will actually work sometimes with avoiding overfitting. If you basically stop right there, not go too far, and actually will be a good, good solution. But it's really hard to control. Somehow, because you never know like when is it like a right amount to stop, right? Right. So for this one, actually, you have more control because you're saying that I'm, no matter what, I'm gonna solve the problem. But by just add by adding this thing, actually, and also you don't know how much you ask, but still, it's kind of feel like you have more control. Right. Right. Yes. Yes. Your classifier needs to be the same, right? You just need to allow your classifier to also scale the location. It will be really interesting if I have those images. It's because I did this yesterday. So I did not have enough time to create like more complex buildings, uh, uh, like the shape there. But you can definitely go for, if you have a more, like you, you, if you have real, uh, like, uh, um, kind of, uh, for example, like uh, the images actually correspond to, to the thing you put into here, you will actually could see actually if we can do a good job. So in general, actually in general, well, such a regression is not gonna perform well if you have too much complexity. This is actually only a present of an idea of what's going on in this classifier. Usually we'll go for, because you can see that the, the idea of this is really simple. If your building is like, like doing that, right? You build like outside will be a negative thing, maybe inside will be a positive thing. You can still do okay, but if your building have a more complex structure, for example, the right, Hello. yeah, like uh, like more than design of the building, your building actually can be uh, like concave and the inside, and you can go through the inside part of the thing, right? It will not do well, like uh, because it will be uh, coincide with a cross, and then you cannot classify well. That's where you need uh, neural nets. Because neural nets is, have a lot of like capability of nonlinear functions, so you, you neural nets usually can do, especially convolutional neural nets is used to directly used for this like uh, uh, image classification. But in that case, you do not have intuition anymore. So, for example, we asking right why we choose this function form to be like penalize all the negative things and then also don't care about like the positive thing right because we have this nice interpretation. But in neural nets. Why do you choose neural nets like uh, architecture like that? I don't know. It works well. Yes, that's usually right. The 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 intuition, but it actually works really well. Yes. Yes. Exactly. So there's definitely limitation. So for this one, we requires the image have uniform. Uh, uh, sizes, right? So for when you have like a, a landscape, then definitely try to run that, or maybe just resize all the picture to be the same. This will be a lot of work, but neural net would be a good choice there. Yeah. 
are you to trust the nature that you're given to the form that you have featured in the table? At the end of the day, this act of trust and serving the future table is that intermediate step of the new Right. But like Shay show us her data. It's yeah. not it's not a uniform sign. No, I know, I know it's not. Yeah, it's she she must have so before it goes into the action and come back, her data must be segmented through some kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll be step. we'll be similar to this. We'll be a, a just a small window of that thing, and then there is a window a, like a building there, and then you just want to tell if it is a building in the picture or not. Or like uh, in general, what type of building? It will be more complicated, but uh, yes. Because it's like small toy, so you guys really can just put it into different pictures to see actually the temptation. Yes. Yes. Thanks, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr.